Well, uh, we're starting a new series, and uh, we're going to do this just a little different. We're going to read the scripture first, which is not usually what I do, but not actually going to go through the scripture a lot. You're going to recognize this, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, and uh, often known as the Great Commission. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. Well, for just three Sundays here, I'm going to do kind of a little mini-series on discipleship. I think, I think I'll do probably three or four of these kind of sprinkled uh, throughout the year. But uh, we're going to begin, number one today, uh, discipleship, the forgotten way. And I want to give you kind of a heads up because this is going to trend negative for quite a while. All right? So what I'm going to be talking about is not going to be real encouraging for a little bit, all right? So if you're a little discouraged this morning, just kind of hang in there, get ready, because I'm going to give you some bad news and uh, some news that's kind of seldom mentioned in the church. We usually don't talk about this, uh, but I think it does need to be talked about so we can get to the good stuff. The, the influence of the church in America today is declining at a very fast rate. I don't know if you're aware of that, um, but, uh, you know, probably for some of us it's not news to us, uh, something we don't talk about. And, and we probably don't like this because it might make us feel, you know, a little guilty or uh, a little responsible uh, in some ways, or, or maybe we talk about the church is declining, we might just think, well, you know, uh, the church is losing, so I must be a loser, right? So I'm kind of on the losing team here. And uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, I was thinking about this, it's kind of like when one of your favorite restaurants closes. I don't know if you've had that, probably all of us have had a, a restaurant that closed. And, you know, like you go there, maybe you've had family gatherings there for years and years, and it might be on the other side of town or something, so you kind of get out of the, the routine of going there. Then all of a sudden you drive up someday, and it's closed. And it's like, what in the world is going on? Why did they close my restaurant? Yeah, see, you know what I mean. Well, you know what this feels like? This is personal. This is emotional. You know, I knew, you know, things kind of needed some updating and you could just walk right in now. You didn't have to, you know, take a number or anything. You just get right in. But I didn't know this was going on. If I'd have known that they were having trouble, I would have come more. They should have told us that we were having trouble. You know, we all would have gone there and eaten a whole lot more so they wouldn't have closed. And it's kind of like you've got this emotional kind of slash guilty involvement here, you know. That's kind of the same way we feel sometimes about the church. One of the saddest things is to sit, just to walk into an old church building that's closed. Um, our family has the church that we grew up in in Illinois closed. And oh my gosh, it was just, you know, so many memories. And you go, how did this happen? Had we known that they were going to close, we would have moved back there and gone, right? Just to keep them open. How could a church like this close? It's very emotional. A lot of disappointment and along with a little bit of guilt and responsibility. And yet we know. We know that going to church, um, even just recently, is not the same thing that it used to be. You know, it, it once was that when I was a kid that... All the good people went to church. All the bad people stayed home. But all the good people went to church. And that's how you could tell the difference, was the bad people stayed at home, and the good people went. And if the good people didn't go to church, you know, I'm using good figuratively. I'm joking, all right. But if the good people didn't go to church, no way did they go out and show themselves in public. I mean, 
No way did you walk around or go shop with it when he placed a shop anyway. But, but no, you just didn't. You hid. You know, you were either sick or you might have to go out of town if you wanted to skip church. Because you couldn't stay home and be seen by someone and not go to church. You had to have, remember when I was growing up, there was a little lady I talk about her a lot named Blanche. And when Blanche would see me on the street, she would say, we missed you on Sunday, Dawn. <laughs> and I was like, uh, 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 the dog had the flu, you know, or uh, 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 there's a gorilla in the yard. You know, you always had to have some kind of an excuse ready for Blanche because she was going to ask you. But that was the way that things were, and it wasn't all good. You know, it really wasn't all good. Uh, but, but that, you know, everybody went to church. Now, to be an American meant that you were a Christian, not because you had so much faith in Jesus Christ. It was kind of a geographical thing, like, you know, living in Kentucky means that you're Kentuckian. It doesn't mean that you believe anything. It just means this is where you are. But that's not the way it is now. Church uh, participation is really plummeting pretty fast, and most recent studies um, indicate <clears throat> indicate that uh, on any given Sunday, it's about 18% of Americans worship. 18%. Now, it used to be, just a few years ago, they said 40%. I knew that wasn't right. I, because if you went to Kroger on Sunday morning, Half of Lexington was there, right, in their pajamas, but, but they were there at Kroger on Sunday morning. So I knew it was less than 40%. So then they, they scaled it down to 25 and, and And now what, uh, there's been some studies where they actually counted heads of church people in churches, and they said, no, it's about 17.8%. Putting that, that decimal on there makes it sound like it's really accurate, you know. Uh, 17.8%. And that, I think that's probably pretty accurate for the whole nation. We, we might be a little bit higher here, but for the whole nation. Um, so um, the trend is down fast. I told you this is negative. See, it's, it's kind of a bummer. 94% of established churches are declining at an accelerated rate. Only 6% are increasing. And there, there are more new churches being started than churches that are closing, but not as many new churches as are needed because of the rapid rise in population. And it's not just the old mainline churches, it's, it's not the inner city churches. I mean, it's rural churches, it's metro churches, it's northern churches, southern churches, east, west, it's, it's big churches, little churches, all kinds of churches. It's even suburban churches are declining now. You know, the trendy, uh, you know, we got buses taking you to the front door and we got everything here for you. And, you know, it's like Disney World for the kids. Even those churches are experiencing decline. And so this is starting to get people's attention because it was always thought before that if you did church really, really well, you would grow. And if you weren't quite as proficient at it, that you wouldn't grow. But who cares? You should just get better, right? But now people are starting to get concerned. There's a rapid decline of the impact in the church in America. And the decline isn't just from people who are leaving the church and staying home now. The decline is also from uh, people who just do not as tend, attend as much as they used to. Okay, now hang on. All right. You all right? Are you okay? All right. I want to pull off another Band-Aid as, as, you know, as we go. Uh, it's, it's kind of depressing, I know. The decline has some causes. I, you know, I'm not an expert in this. I try to stay up on it, but, and I have opinions, which obviously you hear every Sunday. But um, there are some causes, um, depending who you're listening to. Um, things are cultural. You know, most of this is cultural, we think. Things have changed. Uh, they've changed in the past. They're going to change some more. We're in the midst of a huge cultural change as we shift from the, the modern age into the postmodern age. Individuality now is just rampant. You know, Americans have become increasingly disconnected, not just from church, but from families and from each other. 
I mean, individuality is part of this. Technology is part of this. Now, if you want to know something, you no longer need to go to the church to figure it out. You just Google it, right? You can stay at home by yourself, and you can answer a lot of questions by yourself with technology. And uh, consumerism is, is part of it. Uh, as Americans, we're really savvy shoppers, and, and the church is no different. Um, the size of church that's declining the quickest in America has between 100 and 300 members. Those are the churches that are dying the fastest. Smaller churches aren't dying as fast as what that kind of mid-sized church is. And when analysts look at it, they say, well, when they interview the people that are leaving those churches, they say, well, we went always to a larger church because this larger church has more to offer. You see, they've got more things for our kids. And that really is kind of consumeristic attitude is what that is. So that plays in with this too. And these are all cultural reasons. And yet, here's a little bit of good news for you. Uh, the church has existed and thrived for 2,000 years in so many different kinds of cultures. And the culture has never killed the church. As a matter of fact, the church has thrived the greatest in cultures that were the most uh, antagonistic and uh, negative towards the church, in which it had the biggest rub. The church thrived the greatest in those cultures. I mean, the, the, the early church, just think of, of what, what that was. Um, the, the, the Jews were against the early church. The Gentiles were against the early church. Here the, here the Christians were going out and saying, there is one God, and the Gentiles said, no, no, there's hundreds of gods, and we worship when we got them up on the hill. As a matter of fact, we've got one you know, in here in a little shrine in the house. And so that didn't float, right? Then they said, our God came to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who is just a carpenter and a poor man, and uh, as a matter of fact, he died on a cross, and he was resurrected, all that is laughable, it's not sellable, it doesn't go to the culture. That is not relevant at all in a culture. And yet in the midst of that, the early church thrived. Laughable. They were severely persecuted. I mean, they, they not only discounted who they were, but they hated them. And we think it's, you know, it's difficult being a Christian today when somebody makes fun of us or they don't agree with us or, you know, they come back pretty strong uh, on Facebook or something. And yet, you know, in that day and age, there was no such thing as free speech. <laughs> uh, you, you could be killed for what you said. And in that arena, in that culture, the church thrived. So we can't just say it's the culture. The culture isn't what's doing this. The early church grew from 120 people on the day of Pentecost over 250 years, the first 250 years, they grew from 120 people to half of the Roman Empire. Half of the Roman Empire became Christian in 250 years in the most difficult cultural environment that could be imagined. The church has endured in every culture and it's grown the fastest when the church has not been uh, receptive. Um, it's been the most, uh, excuse me, when the culture has not been receptive, and it's been the most ineffective when the expectations and challenges for the church were the least. In other words, when the things were the easiest for the church is when the church was the least effective. And the church is in decline. Now, we've got some old answers. Uh, just give you a couple of them. Uh, growing in effectiveness of the church in America is uh, not new. It's been happening for some time. It's been increasing. But uh, some of these answers seem to be logical or correct. The first one I think about is uh, given by a lot of people. It's just don't worry about it. It's God's problem. It's God's church. God will take care of it. We don't change anything. Just keep doing what you've been doing. You know. And um, who are we to judge? And what goes along with this most of the time is we kind of change the goal. So the, the goal comes from uh, having thriving, vital churches to just having a church that has some people in it, you know, where what are our expectations of our members? That they're breathing, that they don't cause problems. 
I mean, and it's kind of, I know that's sarcastic, but it's true. A lot of times that's what we get to, is we just want some people. We don't care who they are, just give us some people so we're successful. And, I mean, what we do is we just kind of change the goal. Instead of developing, uh, growing, vibrant Christians who make an impact on this world, we just want some people. It makes me think of, outside of our house, uh, the next-door neighbor's uh, high school boy put one of those portable goals out on the street, basketball goals, and it adjusts up and down. And, uh, you know, stupid kids are out there playing basketball. No, that's not me. But but they're out there playing basketball quite a bit. And when the big kids are out there, it's up at 10 foot. And the little kids across the street are about 11 or 12 years old. And so it comes down to 8 foot. When I go out and play, it's about seven foot, you know. So you know how that is. You've all been on an adjustable basketball goal, the thrill of dunking, you know. And I just, wow, I always wanted to do that. Or if you ever played basketball in a pool, wow, that is a lot of fun. It's way down there, wham, on somebody. And, you know, this is the way basketball above the rim is supposed to be played. But, that's, you know, we just lower the rim down until we can dunk, right? Just, just get it down here to my level so it's okay for me. And sometimes in the church, that's kind of what we do is, we, well, let's just make it so it's easy for everybody. We change the goals so that all that's expected is somebody just shows up. Hey, you made it. All right. You win. We win. We've got people. What's expected? Oh, that you're breathing, that you don't cause problems. Is that the church that we want? No. Uh, Trevor and I have this ongoing joke. I keep saying we're going to make a movie about it, uh, and that's about the gathering. You know, when we initially launched the gathering, the idea was that this would not be a high-pressure place. This would be a place where people could rest. You would not come in here and try think that you had to do a whole bunch of things in order to measure up, okay? Because sometimes the church kind of does that. And so I thought, well, you know, it's got to be contemporary. Uh, you have to be able to wear, you know, maybe not your jammies, but, you know, jeans or something like that. And so, you know, kind of low key. And so we have this ongoing joke about, you know, the gathering. It's okay because you're at the gathering, you know. So uh, you get up a little late. Oh, okay, yeah, it's 11. I could probably still make it there. So it's all right because it's the gathering, you know. Fine, it's you know it's okay. Uh, oh, gee, there's spaghetti sauce all over my T-shirt. But okay, where am I gonna go? I'll go to the gathering. It's fine there. I can go there because it's cool. You know, the expectations are way down there. You know, or you, you, we we just take this. You know, the the pass the plate and ah, you know some churches I'd feel like I had to put a dollar in, but I don't hear it's 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 a gathering. Maybe I'll. I'll take five, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's just kind of relaxed and, you know, no pressure whatsoever. And that's a good thing, right? Uh, but it also has the possibility that someone might misunderstand, you know, because, you know, if you're around here for long, you're going to feel some pressure to do some things because almost everybody here does something, right? Almost everybody here volunteers for something. So there's that kind of social expectation and pressure of a smaller church that you don't have in that place where you can just go in and be anonymous. I read reports by a church consultant who um, did interviews with people who left church after attending for a long time, and he interviewed thousands of people and asked them why they had left. And he said that there was a theme that ran through their responses. They gave a lot of different responses. But the number one thing that they said was that they were not challenged. That was his word, challenged. But at this church, they weren't challenged to grow. Uh, they didn't feel that the church cared enough about them to challenge them. And that's one reason why people drop out, is they just don't feel that they are given enough value and worth. So that's one of the old answers. The, the answer that I've used uh, ineffectively uh, has been what I would call the plug and play option. Um, for years, that was my answer along with other pastors. Plug and play means that when you have a problem that you go out and buy something new and you plug it in and it fixes the problem. You know, that's, we use plug and play for electronics a lot. 
and how easy that is, you know. And so uh, there are a lot of church conferences, and that's, that's always fine uh, and fun, excuse me. Go with pastors, and you go to this huge, trendy church, and they have these experts to tell you how your church is nothing, but you could be like them if you would buy this program, this book, and join our network, yada, 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 you know. And so always in the past in other churches, when the church would get to, you know, hey, we're not, we're not actually moving forward. We're kind of stalled out. Say, well, what do I need to buy? We need to start a small group program or we, we need, you know, the, this DVD series or we need to do this thing to get this going again. You know, plug and play. Put something else in. You'll rev back up to where you were and you, you go on. Uh, it never really worked real well. But uh, people still try that, not just in the church, but in all kinds of different places. Back in 2004, the church that really started the seeker-sensitive uh, services, a church named um, Willow Creek up in Barrington, Illinois, uh, did a survey of their people, and it really has changed a lot. Um, there have been a lot of ripples through Christianity because of that. And uh, uh, Willow Creek is uh, Bill Hybels. Maybe you've heard of Bill. And it's this, you know, very large church that really uh, started the unchurch kind of movement where uh, in, instead of using religious language, they made it so anybody could understand what you're talking about. And, and a lot of that's good, you know, because they attracted people that had never been to church or didn't grow up in church. The problem was, was that when they... After 20 years of ministry, they hired a firm to come in and sit down and talk to the people that were in their church. And what they found out was that for most of the people, they were not any closer to following Jesus Christ than when they first came. They had been in the church for years. They had been through all their programs. They had been to the worship services. And yet they didn't pray more. They didn't give more. They didn't, they didn't volunteer more. They were just, they, they arose to the expectation, which was very low. Just live bodies fill the place up. And Hybels and his team said, we've got to, we've got to change this. We, we, this is not our goal. We didn't know. We thought we were making a difference. And so they implemented some, some things in their, you know, in their church to really challenge their membership uh, to, to do something. But that's what the people learned was that they were just not, not challenged. And we can look back now, and I think we can see how God was kind of moving through that whole era in, in American Christianity to create a, a, a discomfort in people, that there, there's got to be something more than what I'm experiencing. You know, there's got to be something more to church, what God had in mind. And, you know, they, to create kind of a discipleship culture where a place where um, people could become followers and teach others how to become followers and where, where Christ was formed and, and helped uh, disciples. Okay, now that's the end of the negative stuff. All right, so you so see you made it okay. It wasn't that bad, was it? it was, we're all talking about them anyway. We're not talking about us. So, uh, But now, you know, we do have to, uh, here comes the challenge part. We finally get to the scripture where we started off, and it's called the Great Commission, as you've heard before. And oftentimes when the scripture is read, the way that it's used means you need to go out and witness to somebody, right? Or you need to give some money for somebody else to go out and witness to somebody. It's those two things. But, but really, it's often treated kind of like the great omission because we've not done what Jesus said to do. Seldom have we done what Jesus said to do. Uh, we've gone out to build churches. But just because you build a church doesn't mean that you've made disciples. You see, if you make disciples, you will always end up with a church. But if you make a church, you will not necessarily end up with disciples. And what he said was he said, go make disciples of all nations. He didn't say go build churches. See, with our American, uh, you know, build this, build that mentality, uh, we think, oh, reach the world. Well, I need to create some kind of system that can do this, and we need to get a business plan and get some money and put a team together and go do this. And that's not what Jesus was talking about at all. We're going to talk about this for three weeks. These were his last words, the last words that he said to his disciples. 
Now, last words are important words. Okay? And what does he tell them? He doesn't say, you know, I, I want you to keep a quiet time. <laughs> he doesn't say, I want you to fast all the time. I want you to tithe. I want to make sure that you go to worship. He says, go make disciples. And he just didn't say, go form churches or create some you know, program to do this. Make disciples. And that's what the church did for uh, hundreds of years, first few centuries, and the apostles made disciples. They had followed Jesus Christ in the same way that he had uh, poured his life into them. They poured their lives into other people. And that is why Christianity spread so fast, person to person to person to person. As a matter of fact, we don't even see church structures come along for hundreds of years. No real church to contain people. It's just person to person making disciples. It's really, uh, you know, church growth by multiplication. What we try to do most of the time is, is addition. We just try to add people. This is, this is different. This is the forgotten way, and that's discipleship. This is why Jesus... That's the way Jesus had done it. We're going to look at that next week and the week beyond that. And, and you know, this is the easy way. This, this is the, so much easier than the other programmed ways, you know, where you try to get people to do things that are outside their gift package. This is really easy because God does the work. We just open our lives up to other people, and he does the work. And it's also the way that he creates a challenge to every person, which is good, because every person finds their purpose. It isn't just you've got a gifted uh, leadership team, but now you realize the gifts that are present in the church. So I want to reveal a new mission statement for us. Uh, we've had a mission statement ever since we started. I wrote it. I was the only one that knew it. Um, I put it on things, but when I would ask even people who had been with us for a long time what the mission statement was, they didn't even know that we had one. So um, I guess they were following it pretty well. Um, the, old, the old mission statement was pretty good, I thought, you know, help create fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I still like that, help develop fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, but uh, it's kind of small. Yeah, it's just kind of, kind of, it's kind of a eight foot goal, right? Anybody can dunk on that. Just help create fully devoted help. I mean, what does that mean? You know, it's just so small. It kind of fit the gathering, you know, where you can wear your PJs and have spaghetti sauce on your, your T-shirt if you want to. It just fit us really, I thought, pretty well. But, but I want to warn you, our, our new mission statement is huge. It's big. All right, and, and you, you, you may laugh, you may think it's too big. Um, I don't know about you, but the world of lowered expectations, um, it just doesn't get me anymore. I'd, I'd rather fail at a high expectation because I can handle failure, but just not do anything. I, I, can't, I can't handle that. So here's the mission statement. Change thousands of lives by making disciples of Jesus Christ who then make disciples. See, that's huge. Change thousands of lives. Look at us this morning. We're going to change thousands of lives? Really? <sighs> Don. <laughs> now, I, I'm not picturing a church of 500 people changing. I'm talking about us changing thousands of lives. And if, if you don't at first grab that, then, you know, you've you got something to learn about God because God uses little things to do big things. We know that. You know, little David and his little stone. Uh, Goliath, biggest example. But also, you've got something to learn about math. Because this is a math principle. It's person to person. Uh, man that discipled Nine and I um, for four or five years uh, visited me every week, stayed in our house every two weeks, spent the night, ate breakfast with the family in the morning, I'm not saying I'm going to do that to you, but he poured his life into us, and not just us, but about eight or ten other people. And I look back on this man's life. This is just one guy. I look back on his life. I really think he's probably affected millions of people. 
because of the multiplication that takes place. You look at the people that he discipled and who they've discipled, and it just gets huge. And this is kind of, you know, a revolution at an evolutionary pace, so it goes slowly. So here's the concept. I just pick four for some reason. Suppose that each disciple uh, discipled four people. All right. Suppose that we poured our lives into four people and they grew in the Lord. And then they in turn, and we taught them how to disciple, and they in turn taught four more people how to disciple. Uh, in six generations, we've got over a thousand people. That's just one of us. It's just one of us here in this room. So I'm, I'm not assuming that everybody will do this. I'm just saying if some of us do this, we'll get there very quickly. As a matter of fact, in 10 generations, the one person doing four and the four doing four and so forth, you get to a million people in just 10 steps, 10 degrees of separation here. So mathematically, I mean, this is multiplication is much just better than addition, right? It's just, it's just, this just works. So maybe, maybe this is too small. Maybe we should say we could change millions of lives. I just didn't think you'd buy that, okay? So uh, may, maybe we'll change it next year, right? If, if, if we've reached a, a thousand this year, maybe we'll change it next year. So how are they going to be changed? Disciples making disciples. You go, oh, I don't know, Don. Uh, I don't know how to do that. You know, I, um, this is kind of... Uh, scary for me because I'm really good at coming to church and listening and getting inspired and doing my stuff, but I don't know about this. And listen, what I said to begin with is this is God. This isn't you. Uh, just, just trust him in this process. It's a slow process, but it does happen when you put your focus on this. So this is something else I thought about. You know, we, we very seldom dream big around here. And I thought about this, we're small enough to care, right? We're small enough to care for each other. But are we big enough to dare? Are we big enough in our faith to dare to do something big, see? And I, I think we are. I really do. I think, I think we are big enough, but that's a challenge to us. That's a good thing, you know, to think, oh, my church is challenging me to make a difference specifically in somebody else's life that I know in the future. There, there, there's no timetable on this. There, there's, there's no um, grid or template for, for, to determine when you succeeded or not. It's just, am I willing to move in this direction to identify people that God, have put, God has put me close to that I might listen to the Lord to tell me how I could help them move towards him. God has a mission for us. It's huge, isn't it? Let's, let's just sit with this for a minute. As deep cries out